Welcome to CS420 Lecture 2. We're going to start with a quick review of our primitives, combination, and abstraction. So primitives are the built-in types that we can build everything else out of. We have strings, we have numbers, we have characters, and characters are inputted with a hashtag, a backslash, and then our character. And then we also have Boolean, so a hashtag T is for true, and a hashtag F is for false. Now let's talk a little bit more about numbers. Numbers, uh, in most programming languages, we have integers or whole numbers, and we also have floating point numbers. In Racket, they're all the same. So we can go ahead and add um, numbers with decimal points to integers, no problem. They're all just the same. It's just a number type. And in fact, when we uh, divide integers, it even turns it into a fraction for us when it displays it. Um, but if we were to add that, that um, and we even get the fraction on the whole number. Now, if we were to add 0.3 and 5 together, you could see that it will keep it as a decimal point. Now, we won't be doing a lot of stuff like that, just uh, pointing out some uh, differences between Racket and other programming languages. Now, uh, we also don't have a maximum number size, so we can come up with a very big number and Racket handles that just fine. We can even do math with really big numbers and Racket won't have a problem with that. But if you try to do this in Java or C or some other language, they usually have problems storing numbers over a certain size. Now here's a new type that you might not have heard of before and it's called a symbol type. And to do a symbol in Racket, you just put an apostrophe in front of any name. You can almost think of these as strings, but they're not something that we would normally print out. Strings are like if you ask a question or want to print something out or want to put text on a GUI, you'll use a string. Symbols um, are more for you as a programmer to name stuff. And of course, it's not naming a variable. But the good thing about uh, symbols is they're really fast to compare names. So um, if you're going to compare strings to see if they're the same string, that uh, you have to compare it character by character. What happens with symbols is um, it stores uh, the name uh, in a little lookup table as a number. So when we have two symbols, it, it converts them both into like a number. And then when we compare, it's a very quick comparison. We'll see, symbols are pretty popular in Ruby and uh, other languages. Um, and they're pretty popular in Racket. We're gonna use symbols quite a lot in this class. But you can think of them as uh, strings that just have a really fast comparison but they're more for internal, your own code. They're not really for printing stuff out. Now some other primitives we have are names. And we can assign uh, names or variables. We can uh, assign uh, variables a, to be a number, an operation, or anything. Uh, that's another uh, primitive that we have, our variables. We also have a lot of built-in functions. Um, like all the math uh, operations, and there's a lot of other built-in functions that we're going to learn throughout the class. And those are all primitives. Next, let's move on to our means of combination. And that's done by creating an expression. Now, um, there's a slight difference between expressions and statements. Expressions always return a value. So they're like functions that return a value. Whereas statements are functions that don't return a value. Now, in Racket, almost everything is an expression. And in fact, down here, there's the number 255. That's the primitive. But when I pr put it on here and I press Enter, that becomes an expression that I'm uh, telling Racket. And you can, you can tell that Racket will print out whatever the value is of that expression. 
So this is kind of a read evaluate print loop. It reads in the expression, evaluates what it is, and in this case it's a very simple expression. It's just a number, so it prints the number back to us. But we um, can also combine expressions together by using a parenthesis. And so we're combining some primitives together. We're combining the plus operation with two numbers. And uh, that's how we combine our primitives together to create more complicated expressions. And so we have little building blocks that we combine together and we make bigger and bigger stuff. So you can kind of imagine like building a house. You'd start off, you know, obviously you have the basement, but say you're building the wall, you can start off with the wood and you start using nails and you combine it together to make a wall. That's what we're doing with expressions here. Now I want to point this out in the lecture notes right here that all a uh, way to combine things together, all uh, expressions where we combine stuff together, always start with an open parenthesis and end with a closing parenthesis. As it says here, there are lots of parentheses in Racket. So, um, and then this thing, the thing that immediately follows a parenthesis will be some sort of operation. And then we have the operands or the arguments or inputs to that operation. So if you ever get stuck um, with the syntax error, a racket has the easiest syntax ever. It's always open parenthesis, some operation, and then the parameters to or operands or inputs to the function right here. So, um, and everything in Racket is exactly like that. So if you're having the syntax errors or troubles, just go back to the basics. Open parenthesis, next thing better be an operation. If it's not an operation, you're probably gonna get an error. And then uh, the inputs to that operation. So in Racket, it's calling a function. Whenever you have an open parenthesis, you're calling a function. And that's why Racket is called a functional programming language. Now let's talk about abstraction. Abstraction is hiding the details so that we can uh, have a simple uh, way to view something. Now um, Racket has lots of ways to uh, abstract details and one of them is by defining uh, something or giving something a name. Now the way you define something is rat in Racket is to use the define operation and then whatever name you want to give it and then what you want to assign to that name. Now we can assign uh, na names to numbers, any of our primitive data types, and we can also assign names to functions that we write. Now up here is called the definitions window and if you notice when you go to save your file it says save definitions. It only saves the tar pot part in the top. It doesn't save our command area down here. And you should be used to that because that's what JES does as well. I just want to show something. If we use define, maybe we'll define pi to be 3.14159. Okay. And um, now if you notice, if we change up here, which I just recently did off camera, it will warn us that the top has changed and we should click run again. And that's what I actually want to talk about is uh, what does run do? You can see that I have defined pi and we see that it's associated with that number. Now when I click run right, and I try typing in pi again, it's going to say it's undefined. So every time you click run, it erases all of your variables. So that's why we usually put our definitions up here. And now when I click run, I can type pi. So what run does is it, it runs all of our expressions up here, which are usually defined statements. And it runs all of our expressions in our definitions window and then we can use them down here in the command area to uh, test them out. Now you should probably read the lecture notes more on prefix notation but I just uh, wanted to talk about that. Prefix notation means you put the operator 
first. And like I said in Racket, um, we're always calling functions and an open parenthesis means the next thing after it is a the name of the function we want to call. So this thing better be a function after each open parenthesis. Maybe I'll show you what will happen if it's not a function. But you can tell with prefix notation, it could be a little bit hard to read and understand. We're not used to it as much. But uh, basically, we work from our inside out. So we kind of find a parentheses on the very inside that we can start with. So this is adding 7 and 6 together. So that would be 13. So we can replace that with 13 here. This will be 9. And then we'd multiply 9 and 13 together. And I'm not going to try to do math in my head while recording a video, but and so on. But it can be hard to read. And the lecture notes do show you how you can simplify this out by uh, separating it out into multiple lines. And you can see here it's separated out into multiple lines. It's a little bit easier to see. And the way it doesn't really mention this in the lecture notes, but the way it does it is we have the operations on one level. And when I pasted this in, it, it did it slightly different. We just try to match up our, uh, so this is operation. So we notice open parenthesis, close parenthesis, and then um, open parenthesis right here. So these two operations happen at the same time. So it's like multiply this and this together. And then um, this operation uh, here, we're going to multiply this operation together and this operation together. So it could be a little bit easier to understand that way. I should probably read through all of the examples in the lecture notes. I'm just going to do a couple examples here. Here we define A to be 3, and next we define B to be uh, A plus 4. So B is going to be 7. But it's important to note that the way this, the order that this happens is very important. First we add, um, first we do this operation right here. That's prefix notation. We work from inside out. So first we do this operation. So we calculate 7 first, and then we assign B to be 7. So if we were to define A to be some other value after we do this, then uh, that would not change B because B is not bound or def uh, set to be the operation or this, uh, this uh, operation right here. It's set to the result of evaluating this. So B is only assigned to 7. B is not assigned to plus A4. So it's uh, B will always be 7 even if A changes afterward. Now uh, Racket does have a little change from the scheme when the lecture notes were written. And if you notice, it won't let us change or redefine variables. And that's one thing in a functional programming language is you actually cannot change the value of a variable. Once we define a, define a name, it's stuck. We can't change a to be anything else. Now, of course, in functional programming languages, we can create our own functions. And this is how you do it. Now, we do it with the define. But there's very, some very slight difference between uh, this define and this define. If you notice our name, it doesn't have parentheses around it. But this name right here that would go in the same spot, notice the second input is A. The second input here has parentheses around it. And that means you're defining a function. This is just a simple way to define functions. We're actually going to learn more about functions later on and figure out a different way to define them. But this is a simple way to start. If you notice, the parentheses around it mean that we're defining a function. So this is the name of our function. And then we have our list of parameters. So this is a function that takes in one input or one parameter, and it just adds one to it. So uh, you can click Run to make sure that all of your functions are defined. And then now we can call our function that we wrote. And you can see that it adds 1 to its input. Um, one uh, trick, if you uh, want to re redo something, or if we want to do this line again, you can hold down the ESC key and then press P. 
and this will work with your touch bar. Hopefully there's the ESC up there. It should work with your touch bar if you're on a Mac. Um, and then it, that um, goes back to the previous line that we have, and now we can do that. Okay, so once again, that's holding down the ESC button and pressing the P to be able to go um, to your previous line. All right, now I'm gonna teach the condition operation and you can read uh, more about the syntax of this. But as you can tell, the open parenthesis, the next thing that comes after it is an operation. Now here's a slight exception because condition is a special operation, um, it next contains a list of parentheses. And there's two things inside of these parentheses, one and two. And this one, again, one and two, and one and two, and so on. So this right here, this parenthesis closes that one, but then we have this set of parentheses that here and here. Now this is an operation or a predicate, and um, basically it's like a switch statement and the first one that's true will get to will be the result. So you could see that this is false, so it's not going to print out A. 5 is not equal to 4. 4 is not greater than 5, so it's not going to print out B. 5 is equal to 5, so it will print out C. Um, now 5 is greater than 4, but it already did C, so it's not going to do the next one. So you can see the result is C. Now you can see this is the general format of a condition statement. We have um, our comparison or operation. Actually, this is called a predicate. More on that in a little bit. Um, and notice there's a parenthesis. It has two things inside of it, the predicate, and then what to do if that predicate is true. So here we have the predicate. And notice the predicate itself is the one that has the parentheses. That's because we're calling the equal operation. So this parenthesis right here is a parenthesis to make a function call to the equal operation that's going to compare 5 and 4. Now um, this full thing together is called a predicate, and a predicate is a function that returns true or false. In 205, you guys studied predicate logic. That was the logic that had the true and false logic. So um, a predicate in a programming language is a function that returns true or false. So whenever you hear predicate, you should immediately think function that returns true or false. Now here's an example of using condition in a function. So notice the parentheses around this right here. That means we're defining a new function called zero question mark. And that function takes in one parameter. And we're going to do a condition. If x is equal to zero, then we'll return true. If it's less than zero, we'll return false. If it's greater than zero, it will return false as well. So um, let's test this out. Five is not zero, but zero is. Now, zero itself is also a predicate because it's a function that returns true and false. In Racket, whenever we put a question mark at the end of a name, that's a, a signal that says this function is a predicate. It returns a true or false value. And it's nice to know that because we can use this function as part of our condition statements or we can use it inside of if statements as well. Now here's a different way to write the zero function that we wrote. We can use an if expression. And previously I've been saying if statement or condition statement, that's just a bad habit. And there are no statements in Racket, they're all expressions. So the if expression right here, the next uh, parameter after we have if, so again the parentheses says we're going to call the if function, although it's not really a function, um, but then we have a predicate right here, 
And then what we do when the predicate is true, and what we do if the predicate evaluates to false. So let's try that one. And we can see that it works as well. In fact, there's an even easier way to, to define this function. And this isn't in your lecture notes. But we can just return the result of um, this it, predicate right here. We can just return whatever equals returns. And that will return us a true, true or false. So. But that's no fun because I wouldn't have been able to show you how the if expression works. So we can see that that works as well. Now this is pretty easy to understand. What gets a little complicated is when these become complex expressions as well. Right now it's just true or false. But we can put parentheses here and call another function when x is equal to 0. We can increment it when it's equal to 0, for, for instance. And if it's not equal to 0, we can return false. Now I need to take the question mark off of this because 0 is no longer a predicate. It's now returning numbers. Um, and if it's not a 0, we can just return it. So um, that's where uh, ifs get a little complicated and conditions. Um, right now, they're pretty easy because this is just a primitive. But we can replace these with more complicated expressions. And um, this x right here could be uh, replaced with a more complicated expression as well. So we kind of get all these expressions nested into each other. So my recommendation when you're writing racket code or when you're trying to read it and understand it is really go back to the basics and try to identify all the parts. If you have an if, make sure you identify the test the condition, what to do when it's true, and what to do when it's false. There's no like then and else. So it could be a little, you could get a little lost in your code, but just make sure you go from parenthesis to parenthesis. That's my predicate. This is what to do when it's true, and this is what to do when it's false. And break it down like that. It'll help you. It'll save you a lot of time. Whenever you have an if or a condition or anything that gets sort of, sort of complicated with a bunch of nested stuff inside, break it down to its uh, three, you know, for the case of an if expression, break it down to the three separate parts. So I quickly want to uh, review what you'll be doing for your homework. Part A, you're going to write a function that cubes a number. That's just taking the number, multiplying it by itself twice. The next part is a uh, writing a new sign, and um, that's a, there is a built-in sign function which I'll show you. But you're going to write a new sign function that takes in degrees or radians, and you have a symbol that tells you I'm passing in 90 degrees, or I'm passing in 1.57 radians. And if the symbol isn't there, then uh, it'll um, print out a string, or it will return a string that has an error. Now, um, just to show you, there is a built-in sign function that you can use, but it only takes in radians. So you'll need to figure out how to convert the radians to degrees. And then you'll have a condition statement that will check to see what the symbol is equal to. And to compare symbols, you could just use the EQ. Um, so radians. Of course, one of these will be a variable um, that it, you take in for input for your functions. And that will say, yes, it's radians, or no, it's not. So you can use something like this in your condition expression to test the symbol. And if the symbol is radians, well, then you just need to return the sign of a function. If it's degrees, then you need to convert the uh, degrees to radians and then do that. So what you'll probably have when it's degrees is you'll have sign and you have more expressions inside of 
there that convert the radians to or the degrees to radians and then the sign then you'll take the sign of that. So hopefully that'll give you a head start onto your homework.